Hello everyone and welcome to We Meet at Digital Days. My name is Lisa Richter and I will moderate this presentation. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our virtual conference. The topic of this presentation is how to design a transformer for manufacturing. Our speaker is Martin Romero. He will hold the presentation and will answer your questions. Before we start, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the presentation. This means that you cannot ask questions via microphone during the presentation. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask questions during the presentation at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the control panel. This presentation will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will be answered in a Q&A session following the webinar. There are five to 10 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we are unable to answer all of your questions within this time, we will answer them via email afterwards. If you still have any other questions left, just mail us at exhibition at we-online.com. We will try to answer all of your questions promptly. At the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We would be pleased if you take the time to fill out a survey and help us to improve our event. You will receive the link to the presentation in the next few days and the recording will be available at our website shortly. So now I will hand over to our speaker and I wish you an exciting presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Martin Romero and uh, welcome to this seminar where we will be taking a look at something that may be different for most of, uh, most of the people who are basically working on uh, designs and power supply designs, is what happens at the ma manufacturing site. How are custom transformers or standard transformers manufactured? and what do we need to think about when we are designing a transformer. Uh, my name is Martin Romero. I'm a design engineer uh, at Burt Electronics Midcom, giving support to European customers. And today we will be talking about uh, DFM. The intention of this uh, webinar is not to give a golden set of rules of what do we need to do to have a good design, but rather to give a few hints on questions we need to ask ourselves when we are thinking about manufacturability. DFM, or Design for Manufacturing, plays a critical part in the whole life cycle of the component. It's important to consider how parts are going to be manufactured from the early stage of the development. You have to think that the later we look into it, the more difficult and expensive it's going to be to optimize the design. Not only cost is affected, but also the overall quality, reliability of the part are closely linked to how the design was done. Doesn't matter to have the best design made, the best transformer with the optimal uh, performance, if we are going to end up having a lot of scrap or a lot of parts failing later on the field. So why do we do DFM? To increase reliability, to reduce cost, to also reduce lead time, but basically to avoid situations like this. Here I have a few examples of what we will be taking a look later on. For instance, we can see here a transformer that was designed using heavy wire uh, wound together with very thin wire. This will cause a lot of problems because the heavy wire will most likely damage the thinner wire. We also have here an example of a heavy wire. When I mention heavy, I mention either with a big cross section or with a lot of strands when we talk about leads that is terminated next to a thinner wire. Of course, as some of you may already guess, the amount of heat that we need to solder this wire to the terminal will most likely damage or directly burn the thinner wire next to it. Other considerations we have to think about is to avoid 
when we terminate wires, uh, solder bridging between the leads that go inside the winding. If we have bumps on the coil, these bumps will most likely be points where it's going to be easy to damage the, the wire. Additional considerations that we may not look a priori into when we are doing our magnetics design is how are we going to bring the wires back to the rail? If, for example, we went in one layer and then want to bring the wire back, of course, we will have to bring it back through the coil and this can lead up into having uh, bumps that will not only make it more difficult to manufacture and make it less efficient due to leakage, but will also uh, compromise our uh, quality and reliability. First of all, how is a transformer uh, built? The key component, I will say, is the bobbin. The bobbin is uh, the piece of plastic around which we will wind the different windings inside a transformer. Here we can see, imagine this is a bobbin as seen from the bottom. So if we take a look into one moment, please, into this bobbin from here, we will be looking at it from the bottom. And around this bobbin is where we will wind the wire. We can wind it in different windings, in different layers. And of course, at, when we finish winding each layer, we will have to terminate the wire to a different pin. Additional components that we will most likely have to add to our transformer, uh, one of them is tape that we will use either to meet safety, if we need to have some isolation between the windings, or for mechanical support, just to keep all the wire nicely together. Finally, the core. We will use the core to uh, keep the magnetic field within it, and we will assemble it uh, around the transformer. Additional components that we can have, if we want to add more mechanical support, we can have clips, we can use adhesive, or we can varnish the part. We can also pot the transformer, or have additional uh, ways to ensure the mechanical integrity of, of it. I mentioned that the bobbin is something critical because the bobbin is very closely um, linked to how the transformer is going to be manufactured. Uh, after choosing the core we are going to use on the transformer, uh, we will most likely, uh, next step before even looking into the wire, is choosing which bobbin we are going to use. Bobbins are usually designed uh, around a specific core, but there are also some mechanical variations which can uh, maybe lead us to choose one bobbin or another for our application. Broadly speaking, regarding the material, as we can see here, there are two main categories of plastics used in the manufacture of bobbins. On one side, we have thermoplastic, and on the other side, we have thermoset. Thermoplastics have a low melting point, point and can be melted and reformed indefinitely. Thermosets, on the other hand, can only be formed once as the bonds which hold the molecular toge molecules together are much stronger. In order to solder the wire to the pins of the bobbin, it's necessary to completely submerge the pins in a solder path. As you may guess, since how what I mentioned a second ago, since thermoset plastics can be remolded with heat, most likely uh, they will have a higher chance of being deformed when submitted to high heat, as we said, like with the solder bath. Since the Rose directive is burning lead in solder uh, during soldering, the temperatures have to be much higher, and this is causing thermoplastic to melt way easier. Why would we like to use thermoplastic then? The main advantage that thermoplastic have is that they are very easy to mold and they are very flexible. As soon as we have very complex uh, geometries on the bobbin, it will maybe make sense to use a thermoplastic. But on the other side, we will have to control very well 
our soldering process. An additional consideration is that uh, when we have to perform ER reflow, uh, for example, with SMD parts, maybe it makes sense to consider a higher temp melting temp temperature thermoplastic or even to go directly with thermoset. And here comes the other question. Why don't we always use thermoset? Uh, thermoset are less flexible, so we cannot have uh, difficult to uh, mold geometries on it. Bobbins have to be very, very simple. They are very difficult to mold uh, and they are less flexible. This means that they are more brittle and they are easier to break during the manufacturing process. Once we know which bobbin we are going to work with, uh, we have to think about which processes are going to be uh, affecting the transformer. We have mainly four different processes. Uh, on one side is uh, winding, next termination, soldering, assembly. Although they can be treated differently, um, they can also affect each other. For example, bad winding can be the root cause to issues during soldering or assembly. Here I have uh, something I would like to really share with you. It's one of the most important uh, topics when we consider uh, TFM is uh, winding. Considerations we have to think about is first of all the pinout, then the layering, and then if we have any drag packs or any wires that have to move from one side to another. When we think about the pinout, uh, quite often uh, I see a lot of pinouts that are neglecting manufacturing. They think mostly about the application, how the transformer is going to be soldered on the PCB, where we want the tracks to be. But on the other side, uh, this can lead to having wires crossing inside the transformer. As you can see on this example, we have some 90 degrees uh, crossings, which maximize the pressure on this point where the wires are crossing. And any additional wires uh, making pressure between these two wires or the wires themselves can uh, compromise the insulation of its winding emanuel leading to a um, short circuit between them. Uh, also, uh, the heat during soldering or during the wire termination will flow through and through the wire from both terminals and will eventually also concentrate here where both wires are touching. One way to avoid it is to choose a pinout that avoids wire crossing like the one here we have on the right. But the drawback on this case is that wires can eventually lead to be on the core assembly window. This means that they can be scratched by the core or even completely damaged by the core. Which one, which approach should we use to allow wires crossing or to try to avoid it? It's difficult to say. My advice is to go case by case. If we find a case that uh, we have enough space, then I will say try to avoid wires touching. But if we cannot do it because either the application requires one termination to be on one pin and this is going to lead to the pin, the wire from the pin to cross other wires, then I will say that that will be the way to, to go. As we will see in a minute, there are other ways of avoiding wires from crossing, but I would like to look into it with an example. Imagine we have standard uh, flyback design where we have on one side the primary, on the other side we have the secondary, and we have an auxiliary winding that has to be wound uh, on top of the primary. Uh, let's look at the primary side. If we want to choose a pinout, easiest first pinout that will come to our minds can probably be starting from pin number one and then terminating on pin number two. I'm adding a center tab because I would like to uh, do a split in series between the primary and the secondary 
and do a sandwich between them. So my intention will be to wind my primary, then wind my secondary, and then wind my primary on top of it. Afterwards, I will wind the auxiliary on top of all of them. So let's terminate our primary winding on terminal number one, winding all across the transformer in this direction, and again, terminate on pin number two. Next step will be my secondary. We will not look into it, but we will look into the next uh, winding of the primary. We will connect it on series using terminal two. Again, wind, in the, wind it in the same direction and terminate on pin number three. Finally, we will wind our auxiliary and we will start on pin number four, wind it following the same direction and terminate on pin number five. As some of you may already be seen from the previous slide, here we have the wire from terminal number four crossing at probably 90 degrees, uh, the terminations from pin three, two, and one. This is something that we would like have to avoid. Even some safety standards go to a step, one step further and um, mention that wires should not cross at 90 degrees, between 45 and 90 degrees. Uh, so what can we do? One of the first approaches we can think about is, okay, what about if we apply some tape? After we wind uh, the second primary so that we can protect uh, it from the auxiliary winding. Another solution can be to tube the entire termination that goes into pin number four. We can also use self tape or margin tape. We can also try to wind it such a way that we avoid the leads. But of course, all of these actions are, gonna, are going to affect our production because it's adding more material, adding more production steps, of course, increasing the cost of the part. Another solution can be, okay, let's think about the pinout, but instead of starting on pin number one, we will start on pin number two. We terminate on pin number three. Again, we start on pin number three, terminate on pin number four. And now the auxiliary, instead of starting on pin number five, we will start on pin number one. This way, we avoid the wires from crossing and we minimize the risk of needing additional material to insulate the wires. Another uh, topic that we will have to consider, and especially when we have more than one termination on a bobbin rail, is what happens when we have to add self-tape. Self-tape or margin tape is a common practice used to increase creepage and clearance distances. The problem we face with it is that if we avoid the wires from touching, let's say choosing uh, terminals that will uh, take care that the wires don't cross, like on this picture, here we can see wires crossing, but here we swapped the terminals, just to create some separation and avoid the wires from crossing. This can have another side effect, which is that the leads can come close to the core, uh, violating uh, the safety distances that we should be able to, to meet. Another consideration that is uh, normally mostly seen when the parts uh, hit the lab and we build our first prototypes is wire trackbacks. Uh, when we do calculations, a lot of times we can avoid or we can uh, try to underestimate the effect of drag packs on the build, but this is something that we have to always consider, especially when we are using heavy wire. A drag pack is basically when we wind the transformer in one layer and we want to terminate on the same side, but we don't have an even number of layers, we have to find some sort of way to bring the wire back. Let me just change to 
a different color. Uh, I cannot change wire colors. Oh, sorry. But when we have to bring the wire back, this will obviously create a bump, and this bump will uh, affect our overall build. There are some packages that tend to have a uh, higher bumps and more um, more problematic. Uh, especially, for example, I will highlight EFD packages, any SMD low profile packages. We will have to take special consideration and special care when we uh, have any drag packs. Here, here we have a picture from the um, uh, from the beginning where we can see uh, six uh, very heavy strands being drag, 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 uh, being dragged back across the transformer on the belly of the transformer, and when we apply tape on top of it and then want the next layer of a wire, we can see that there is a huge bump that will be increasing, first of all, our leak inductance, and second of all, uh, will maybe even lead to having issues during soldering or during the proper assembly if the bump is above the standoffs of the bobbin, these standoffs. As we said, uh, same as with the leads, uh, track packs can um, uh, damage the, wind the winding by having pressure on the wire at 90 degrees. Um, especially if we have uh, more layers on top of it, we can insulate it with tape, for example. We can start applying one layer of tape and then uh, dragging the wire back on the top of that tape, but of course that will increase uh, labor and cost. Another solution can be, okay, why not spiral the wire back? Means that the last uh, turn, like on this image here, we spiral it back. So here our angle is not 90 degrees, but it's a little bit bigger. This can be a solution, but again, it will have a trade-off. And the trade-off is that on the sides, we have to make sure that we have enough space to assemble the course. Otherwise, we can risk from scratching the wire, damaging the wire, and creating a sort between the core and the wire. Layering. Um, something to think about, not only because of performance, but also because of manufacturing again, is to choose the right wire diameter. Maybe we want to minimize the DCRs by using a high, a wide uh, transformer with a very small American wire gauge or a wide diameter. But here we have another drawback, is that the uh, thicker the wire, the less space we will be able to optimize uh, on the winding meaning that we will have a lot of empty space, the bulkier the winding will be, and of course, the more difficult to wind subsequent layers, and also uh, the higher the leakage inductance we will have. Here on the other side, we have the same cross-section uh, transformer with a thinner wire, which will eventually also help to reduce AC resistance uh, in some cases. But regarding manufacturing, this will be easier to produce, easier to wind, and easier to terminate. Termination, as mentioned before, plays a special role. Uh, we have to be careful when we choose the wire combinations that are going to be terminated on the same side. Sometimes, especially when we are having um, high current on the primary and an auxiliary wand on the same side, we may think, okay, we can wind the high current primary with a heavier wire and then only use a thinner wire for the auxiliary. This can be a good practice in theory, yes, but we have to be careful that the heat we need to use to solder this heavy wire does not damage or burn the thinner wire we are going to solder on the same side. I have later a video where I will like to show you how soldering is done. 
uh, or at least show you a few slides on how uh, deep soldering is done. Some of you will be familiar with it, some of you may not, but then you will really see what I mean. Transformers are deep soldered in a bath of tin. Uh, so we will try to solder all these terminations at the same time. Of course, as I just mentioned, the amount of heat that the thick wire needs to solder will be way more than what the thinner wire would actually need and will eventually lead to the thin wire to be damaged. Another topic to think about when we talk about terminations is that before we mention that we can avoid wires crossing by applying crossover tape or applying self tape. On this case, we have this termination here that is being isolated from these three terminations by self tape. And these two terminations are being isolated from each other by, um, uh, by crossover tape. The drawback of crossover tape is that it has to be very well controlled. Otherwise, as you can see here, this tape is already peeling off and can lead to the wires to, to totes. Here we have another example where we have the wire uh, hardly bending uh, nearly at 90 degrees uh, on the bobbin rail. And this case may need a different kind of termination. If we want to have a more robust part with higher quality and higher reliability, we may want to use tubing for the terminations. It's a very effective way of uh, protecting the leads, but uh, it's a little bit more expensive than the other alternatives. Uh, another benefit that we have with uh, tubing is that if we want to meet safety, can be also used to meet safety when we are not using insulated wire and can also help to uh, reduce the heat damage on the wire. Here I have a small um, PowerPoint on soldering. So as you can see, uh, transformers are deep soldered in typically SN96 AG4. And the intention is to um, solder the terminations, burn any additional insulation on the wires that are touching the um, pins and um, terminating all or an entire row on the same time. Here I have uh, three pictures of an auto soldering uh, station where first of all, we can see uh, how the transformers uh, get an application of flux. Then here the an entire row of transformers that are placed here are tilted before being deep soldered uh, just to terminate one of the sides of the transformer. Later on, we will do the same application, but tilting on the other way. So we deep solder both, um, both sides of the transformer. Finally, basic considerations. Large single strand is more difficult to solder. Uh, we should try to avoid using heavy wire or leads wire on the same bobbin rail with fine uh, wire windings. Uh, a rule of thumb is to always try to keep all windings on the same bobbin rail within three American wire gauges. And eventually, sometimes it will make sense to use heavier wire than necessary only for soldering. For example, what we mentioned before, if we have a primary with high current, we may want to uh, match the similar gates with the auxiliary only for the sake of manufacturability. One last topic to think about is um, when we are using heavy wire, we may want to try and make sure that uh, our solder terminations are below the standoffs. Standoffs are this bobbin plastic used to ensure a consistent surface A on the transformer. But of course, if our soldering is above these standoffs, our surface A will be inconsistent and the solder will be in touch with the PCB, causing transformers to tilt and uh, be in a high risk for further quality uh, issues. Just to summarize a few more minutes, design for manufacturability 
is the practice of considering the manufacturing process during the design states. We do it not only to increase, to uh, reduce cost, sorry, but also to increase reliability and to reduce also the lead time. The easier part is to manufacture, the shorter it will be to produce, the less steps we will have in production, the less risk to have uh, quality issues, lower the cost and lower the lead time. And as I said at the beginning, the earlier uh, DFM is considered, the uh, more benefit we can have from it. That's why I always say, please try to not leave manufacturability for the end of the design and try to always involve the transformer manufacturer as early as possible in the design phase. I think um, we are going to um, move soon to the questions. I would like to have just two more minutes to show a video uh, because I think these presentations will be way nicer with a nice video. So you can have an idea of some of the processes. Here we see a semi-automated uh, application of self-tape where transformers are manually placed by the operator and the self-tape is uh, applied directly on them. We can do the same for uh, tape for uh, mechanical support or also applying for sa safety. And this can be also applied on the same machine as the winding is, is done. Uh, here you can also see how the nozzles of the wire are rooting the terminations across the bobbins. And now you can see how the winding process is done on a fully automated uh, machine. I, next step, here you can see a semi-automated soldering station where the um, transformers are tinned in a bath. Here you see automated uh, taping machines and here you can see an automated testing station. I th uh, one moment, please. Yeah. Here uh, you can see one station where we have custom fixtures uh, to fix the transformer for auto testing and also for auto coplanarity uh, reviews. A idea of DFM is not only to make a design easy to manufacture, but also to adapt it to, to the uh, manufacturing capabilities of its manufacturer. The advantage is that we can reduce uh, the cost, reduce the lead time, and also especially be able to reuse uh, capabilities that we have for different transformers. Uh, minimizing, the, minimizing the initial investment uh, we may need for um, a custom project. Uh, here, again, more uh, fully automated coil winding. I don't think we have so much more time left. I will see if we can find something more interesting to see. Um, here you can see the pictures we saw before of a auto uh, termination station. As you can see, the transformer are tilted both ways and we try to uh, solder all of them on one row. Uh, this is an advantage because we can reduce the lead time and reduce the cost by um, soldering many transformers at a time. But on the other side, it requires a lot of control and quality supervision because the more we solder at the same time, the higher the risk, risk of having issues uh, with it. Mm. If you have any questions, uh, you can write them down and we will have uh, five more minutes to answer them. And uh, if you also want to think about any questions with time, you can also, uh, as my colleagues mentioned at the beginning, send us an email and I will take some time to, to answer the, the questions. Thank you very much, Martin, for your interesting presentation. 
like you already said, we will take your, our attention now to uh, the questions. Um, so uh, let's have a look. There's one question um, regarding soldering. Can we solder LITS wire on the same terminal as normal wire? That's a good question. My answer is depends. Technically, yes, we, we, we can solder it. The, uh, what I would say is that we cannot, for example, solder a very heavy uh, leads wire next to a very thin uh, uh, magnet wire. Try to balance, um, try to balance the, um, the wire gauges you are using. Uh, it's something that the best location and the best moment to uh, evaluate it is especially when the first samples are built. If we do a full uh, DFM analysis, uh, we do some reliability testing and we check, yes, if it can be soldered and terminated, yes. I mean, it can be done as long as it's well controlled. Try not to put a um, very heavy wire next to thin wire, same with leads. Don't use very heavy leads next to a very thin magnet wire. Okay, great. So there's another question. Um, what soldering process is usually used? Immersion in solder batch. So as we mentioned before, uh, normally we will try to do a full batch of transformers, as we can see on this slide, deep solder into a thin bath. If this cannot be possible, because either the transformers are way too large or we uh, think that maybe, for example, we decided to use thin wire next to heavy wire, we may have to solder each transformer uh, individually. One example can be, imagine this is a bobbin. Sorry for my bad quality of drawing, but I'm not, um, I'm not the best uh, at drafting. Imagine we have a very heavy wire wound on this terminal and a thinner wire want on this other terminal. Maybe it makes sense to tilt the bobbin while we are soldering it, so we can spend less time to solder the thinner wire and longer time to, thinner, to solder the, um, the um, heavier wire. Okay, one more question. Are there thermoplastic with 180 degree temper class? With how much temperature class? 180. 180 degrees temperature class. Mm -hmm. I will have to look into it. Uh, there are some uh, thermoplastics that you can use uh, with higher temperatures, even with high temperature insulation systems. But again, 180 degrees is not a very high temperature. Think that our thin buds are probably going to be even somewhere around 380 uh, degrees, because again, due to the ROS uh, directive, ROHS, uh, we cannot use lead on the soldering process. This means that uh, our temperatures are, of course, going to be uh, higher. I will look into it, and if you want, I will send you later um, some thermoplastics that, you, that can be uh, heat resistant, but again, if you are trying to use high temperatures, even on the application, also the plastics can theoretically withstand the temperature, it will be better to use a thermoset uh, directly. Okay, great. So thank you. I think uh, now we've finished with this presentation. If there are any questions left, we will answer them via email afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed our presentation. The next presentation topic um, is loop compensation in SMPS, example of bug with voltage mode control. See you there and enjoy our digital days. Goodbye. <laughs>